face of disparate regions and peoples um, in the increasingly interconnected early modern world. One of the main points I have to make is that in this process that although uh, the, the globalizing networks um, brought different peoples and regions together, they also um, functioned to keep them apart. Um, and in fact, in many ways, that tension between bringing them and keeping them apart, I think, is central to the history of the slave trade and slavery. Um, and in many ways, I think it's all broader to the um, bigger dynamics of global and colonial economies. Spencer Smith was born about 1728 um, in the Savannah region of West Africa. Um, as a young child, um, about 10, 12 years old or so, um, he was um, taken captive in a war um, and transported um, to the coast where he was sold. Um, he ended up um, crossing the Atlantic, and instead of being sold with most of the ship's cargo in um, Barbados, um, he instead returned with the ship um, and its officers and crew uh, to Newport. He was held in slavery um, for several decades on a series of coastal New England farms on Fisher's Island and Stonington, Connecticut. Um, also spent some time on Long Island. Um, he eventually managed to secure his freedom um, in the 1760s. And over time, accumulated substantial property that allowed him um, first in Long Island and then in uh, Haddam Neck. Um, and this property eventually became a 110-acre farm with a number of associated um, houses and barns and associated buildings. Um, gave him the wherewithal with which to purchase his children and his wife um, and to support them in um, a comfortable way. Um, and in fact, it was the capital uh, of his farm that really supported um, his children um, through much of their lives. In many ways, uh, Benjamin Smith also, um, at the end of the 18th century, um, told the story of his life. And it was published in 1798 by a new London, a renegade new London printer. Um, and so he also, in this, in this important way, became not just a local figure, but a person who intervened in the broader public culture and broader debates over slavery, the slave trade, over racism, and over citizenship. In many ways, Spencer Smith's story was extraordinary. The perspective he offers is amazingly rare. Out of some 12 million survivors of the Middle Passage, only about a dozen left behind first person accounts of their experiences. And his story, I think, has profound implications for his period era and our own. It seems to me that it reveals in powerful and dramatic ways um, the, the double colonial dynamics of convergence and containment um, and their legacies, split identities, hybrid cultures, self-divided societies. In this broader project, I focus on the ways in which Venture Smith's struggle for freedom, equality, and self-understanding help us think in new ways about the relationships between 18th century Africa and the Americas, about the colonial origins of modern globalization, and the politics of historical memory. And indeed, in recent years, it's been a surge of scholarship that's helped to lay the foundations for this kind of work. For instance, uh, Robert Harms, this is at Yale, wrote a powerful book on the French slaver, um, The Diligent. I don't know. I call it Diligent. Um, a book that emphasizes <laughs> a book that emphasizes this va the vast reach of early modern markets and the transformative power of these markets in far flung places. So he there connects kind of French financial policy in Paris. Um, to um, imperial development in Abomey, for instance. But in part, because of the limits of the documentary record, these transoceanic networks are frequently studied from the point of view of European merchants, mariners, and imperial officials. And similarly, the slave trade and um, slavery and anti-slavery are also frequently studied from the point of view of white planters, white merchants, and white political activists. So one of the basic interventions Venture Smith makes into this debate or this ongoing discussion um, is that he gives us a bottom-up perspective that refocuses our attention 
on important aspects of these processes and their legacies from the point of view of one of the people at the center of this trade, at the center of slavery. So I'll just review a couple of ways in which Fincher Smith's narrative, I think, allows us to see the history of slavery and the slave trade and citizenship in America in new ways. One, Fincher Smith's vivid personal account illuminates this broad dynamic, oh, the 12 million people, blah, 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 in intimate, experiential ways. Um, second, Fincher Smith's story reminds us that regions studied separately, um, often studied separately, such as West Africa, the West Indies, and in this case, particularly New England, which is often thought of as separate from those dynamics, were in fact all part of not only the history of slavery in particular, but part of the broader history of modern colonialism. Viewed within this framework, um, or at least within a national, well, viewed within a national framework, that's really the point um, colonialism often appears as a matter of political independence. So we talk about the American Revolution as ending the colonial period. But if we think about colonialism as a broader set of political and economic relationships, um, what we see is, is colonialism as part of large-scale migration patterns, territorial conquest, mercantilist restrictions on trade, racial hierarchies and ideologies, complex cultural politics, and split and double identities. And so this is, these are ways of thinking about the history of colonialism that are separate from specific national identities and, and state regimes. Second, or third, I lost count. Um, third. Um, <laughs> This story reminds us of a couple important things about these early modern networks. Recent studies of the Black Atlantic, I don't know how much of you all are reading on the Black Atlantic, we've got a mixed crowd here, a lot of academics, a lot of non-academics. Um, but recent studies of the Black Atlantic emphasize the theme of endless, uh, endless circulation, endless hybridity, exchange between Africa and the West Indies and Britain and North America. But this metaphor, um, in the same way that the diligent emphasizes this theme of circulation around the Atlantic. But this theme as of a circulation, um, as Stephanie Smallwood points out in Saltwater Slavery, um, which I don't know if they did or just simply should have won the Douglas Prize, um, <laughs> is a, um, is you, this theme of circulation is one that's from the point of view of merchants and captains and seamen and the ships themselves. Um, not from the point of view of African people, uh, African descended people in the colonial period. Um, while the slave ships continue the triangles of trade or their polygons of trade, captives by and large moved from West Africa to the Americas. And most of them didn't return. In fact, many of them died um, relatively early in their experience in the New World. Spencer Smith, in that, case, in that example, um, is typical. Um, he moved from the Savannah to the coast of West Africa, from the West Africa to the West Indies to New England, and then within New England, his life, in many ways, traced smaller and smaller orbits. Um, he moved from, you know, the distance from Barbados to Newport is bigger than the distance from Fisher's Island to Stonington <laughs> to um, South Hole, um, and then to East Haddam. And in many ways, his life became more settled as he became a property holder and became more secure and had acquired a certain level of um, control over his destiny. So, this is one way in which the metaphors we use to understand this Atlantic world um, are challenged if we rethink of these experiences from the point of view of enslaved Africans. Um, rather than the point of view of the merchants who were designing business opportunities. Indeed, another basic point I wanted to make is that Smith's narrative reminds us that underlying all of these um, dynamics is a basic tension. Colonial networks function not simply by bringing separate worlds together, but also by dividing uh, worlds from each other. While the slave trade connected West African and American worlds with amazing efficiency, both the colonial trade and colonial slavery depended for their profitability on erecting barriers, defining differences, and establishing hierarchies. 
so that access to markets, access to information, access to ideas could be controlled and exploited. So this is, I'll just briefly say, this is really obvious uh, in the um, case of the slave trade in West Africa, where Dave and Dana and Tom and some of the rest of us were um, hanging in Anglophone memory these days, um, West Africa. And it's a big fortified trading post right on the beach, um, because European traders, if they had their way, would have gone and invaded West Africa and conquered the area and taken over, but they couldn't because local peoples were militarily more powerful. So what the European traders were able to do was to get permission to erect trading posts, which they kept fortified. Um, both, um, all of the Europeans were trying to keep all of the other Europeans out. So all through this period, the English are trying to keep the French off of um, the coast of what is now Ghana. The French are trying to keep the English and the Dutch all out. Um, the Danish keep coming in. Um, they pretty much have gotten rid of the Portuguese from this region by that period. And the point is the Europeans are all trying to keep each other out. Meanwhile, the Royal African Company um, has an official um, fleet. Um, and then there are free traders who are arguing against the privileges given to this um, state-sponsored monopoly. Although while continuing to argue that the English government should continue to finance the, the maintenance of these trading posts. Uh, corporations trying to get the government to finance the externalities um, of their trade relationships, um, competition between different um, national interests, um, and conflict between so-called free trade um, and restrictions on trade uh, are all played out from the European point of view. From the African point of view, um, there's a similar dynamic at work. Venture Smith's story of how he got to the coast is strange and difficult to interpret. But the basic way people got to the coast would be you would be captured in a war hundreds of hundreds or so miles from the coast, and then those people who captured you would sell you to some merchant, some middleman, who would then sell you further down the road to another merchant, um, who would then eventually sell you to someone um, on the coast. And the people on the coast, in this case, um, people down in Mabu, in the Fanti um, Confederacy, um, would then um, sell you to the Europeans. So in Anamabu, what they wanted to do was have access to all of the Europeans. So the Europeans were trying to prevent each other from getting to the coast. The Fanti want everybody to come to them. Um, but the Fanti don't want, for instance, the Asante to be able to get to the coast. They want the Asante to keep stay up in Kumasi and stay up um, above the rainforest, essentially, um, so that they can serve as a middleman and not allow the Asante to have direct access to the coast. And that dynamic produces a whole series of wars in this period, and there are large-scale consequences for West African history in this period. One of them is the expansion of heavily militarized larger states in this period of time. <coughs> the Fanti Confederacy grows from small section of the Ghanaian coastline to almost the entire Ghanaian coastline in this period. The Asante grow from a, rel you know, from a small geographical area to a very large geographical area. Um, and eventually end up um, getting to the coast by the end of the century. So, um, keeping everybody, keeping different political groups separate so that interfaces between them can be exploited. Um, and in all these cases, the interests of the different sides are opposed to each other. Slavery, of course, works exactly the same way, except that instead of keeping people physically, geographically separate, slavery <laughs> depends on bringing people geographically together and then keeping them in a social hierarchy. Otherwise, if you're going to take people from Africa, bring them to America, and treat them just the same as you would um, other people, uh, there'd be no reason not just to bring people from Ireland or Germany or anywhere else. The point of um, enslaving Africans is that you can, they allow the English to um, establish a hierarchical social structure in which there were different standards for different groups of people. All right. So, I suppose what I've tried to make clear here is that in, in this book, what I'm trying to do is combine a very intimate life story with a rather wide-ranging analysis. Um, this is possible for several reasons. One of them is there are all sorts of people in recent years who have been researching um, the, the life of Venture Smith and the history of slavery and freedom in New England from a variety of different points of view. We have here Lucien Laban, who spent years um, doing excavations at the site of Venture Smith's farm um, in Haddam, uh, Haddam Neck, um, and um, has 
hundreds of boxes of artifacts that have been recovered from the scene, and we were able to trace out foundations of different structures he lived in. So that's one set of expertise. Chandler has been um, uh, organizing or instigating um, all sorts of mayhem, including uh, a project that involved excavating Venture Smith's, exhuming Venture Smith and his wife's and children's own graves, um, to see what could be learned from that process. And has also been getting um, a number of historians involved in um, documentary research. Rob Forbes, for many years, has been interested in this project, um, and has also been inspirational in um, finding new avenues and new sources of documentation. So what we have is, um, and I'm not really naming everybody, there are a whole bunch of Venturistas out there, um, <laughs> including um, Desert Dunn. Um, so we've got, um, he's approaching Venture Smith's narrative from a more literary point of view. So we've got a whole series of historians, literary scholars, archaeologists, anthropologists. Oh, meanwhile, you know, UConn is, Linda Strassel at UConn is working on a DNA project that's attempting to develop a new model of how ancestral lines can be traced um, through DNA. Um, using Venture Smith and his family as a case study. So, meanwhile, there's a whole series of kinds of documentation that, that support all of these different lines of research. You know, often in this project, um, which I've been calling the Lost Worlds of Venture Smith, I think it's really not him that's lost, it's me. <laughs> um, all right, so today I wanted to talk um, about some of the fruits of this research. And I have Specifically, what the evidence from court records suggests to me about the history of slavery and freedom in early New England. Um, and I wanted to emphasize the ways in which the focus I've, I've been trying to work on, or the issue I've been trying to focus on, is how the relationship between masters and enslaved people is shaped by their interactions with a broader public. And so for me, what's, what's interesting here is that this is this master-slave relationship we often think of as a binary relationship between the master and the slave. Um, and that's from a model of plantation slavery um, that has dominated the scholarship, in, at least in North America. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, but for me, it's this triangulation between the master, the slave, and then the public that kind of sets the rules. How much violence a master can get away with, whether or not a slave can escape, um, who determines whether someone is free or not free. So let's begin with the example of escape, because we have this nice runaway advertisement. Um, Fincher Smith had arrived in, on Fisher's Island around um, the year 1740. Um, I reckon he was about 13 years old, and he worked there for about the next 14 years. So early, it was about this time of year, a little bit earlier than this, um, about this time of year, when he was about 27 years old, maybe 25, something, okay, mid-20s, that his relationship with his master reached a breaking point, and he made a run for it. This being Fisher's Island, they didn't make a run, literally, they hopped in a boat and sailed away. And in his case, what he did was that he and a number of other um, servants of um, George Mumford on Fisher's Island, um, made plans several days in advance. They stored up enormous 80-pound wheels of cheese. They stole a whole batch of bread. Um, so they took, they took all the clothing they could grab. Um, so all the sort of shoes with them. You'll see from this amazing quantity of clothing and shoes and stuff they took with them. Um, and they set off in this nice um, square stern two-masted boat um, heading in the case, as Spencer Smith recalls in his narrative, um, to Mississippi. They didn't get quite as far as Mississippi, um, and in fact, what they ended up doing was ending, um, stopping um, to um, eat, to cook some food, and to rest, to get some water, on the point on uh, eastern end of Long Island. And while they were on the eastern end of Long Island, um, Venture Smith, indentured servant that he describes as the runaway out of as from Newark, um, and two other black men. Um, and when they landed on the shore of Long Island, the um, just about he said, oh, I'm going to go off and look for water. Venture said, oh, I'll go off and look for water. Um, and the two other guys were left to make a fire and start cooking dinner. So not much time passed before 
the um, venture smith came back to check on the guys making dinner and to see what was up with them. And they said, oh, well, actually, as it turns out, um, Joseph Hede just took all of our clothing and ran away. Um, and what did, this is a really fascinating moment here, because what happened is, instead of saying, all right, kids, pack in the boat, we're going to get out of here uh, before an alarm is raised, uh, what Venture does is he goes into the village, um, says, I'm looking for a runaway indentured servant named Joseph Hede. He's about this tall, he's got a ruddy complexion, um, and boy, is George Mumford going to want to get him back. So he kind of sabotages his own escape um, by tracking down Joseph Hebe. And in fact, to, and so he goes from being an escaped slave to being a slave catcher. Um, and he, in fact, gets local people to bring um, Hebe back to the boat. Um, he piles everybody into the boat. He sails back to Fisher's Island. Um, and he says, uh, dear Mr. Mumford, yeah, so sorry about the escape attempt. Um, the good news is um, I brought everybody back. Um, and he says, you know, in this circumstance, what I tried to do was use this as an opportunity to see if I couldn't, you know, at least an advantage out of the situation. So the basic point we have here is that Venture Smith's experience of slavery is one of continual negotiations. This is a long-term relationship in which he's constantly jockeying um, to improve his situation. He's constantly recalculating his op. It's not clear that he's always making entirely rational decisions or exactly why he's making his decisions. I still don't understand why he didn't let Joseph Hesse go and just leave. But he did. Trying to pass himself off as a free man. His master is trying to track him down. And an important event, uh, he can t t um, send a message to the uh, local newspapers, have a notice printed with a detailed physical description, and more than other sources, any other source, about what. Um, all sorts of things about slaves, how tall they were, um, what hairstyles they wore, or what clothing they wore. Um, for instance, we would not know um, exactly how tall Venture Smith was, or um, which is 6'2", according to this, which is very tall for the period, um, or that he had um, country marks on his face, um, if it were not um, from this narrative. It doesn't, unfortunately, give a diagram of the country marks. So. There's limited utility to that piece of information, but none of that. To use runway advertisements to look at what kinds of people are most likely to run away. Um, the answer is almost always men. Six out of seven runaways are men in, this, in New England. Um, they almost always, about six out of seven, are in their 20s, between about 18 and 30. Um, so it's a perfect example of a runaway, or a typical example of a runaway. It's right age, uh, right gender. Most runaways run away also when the weather gets good. Um, so starting in April, runaways bump up, um, peak in July and August, and then fall down again into the fall. Um, and almost nobody runs away in the middle of winter in New England. Again. There seem to be practical reasons for that. Um, but the broader point I'd make about runaway advertisements is that they are an invitation to the public to intervene on behalf of the master in a kind of an ongoing struggle, they're trying to reinvent themselves. They're trying to change from an identity as a slave imposed on them by their master into a new identity as a free person. And often they do that by, with a story. Um, sometimes they do that by kind of disappearing into the woodwork. Um, many runaways um, appear not to have actually intended to escape. Often. Uh, we, I think of these as kind of expressive runaways. So somebody's whipped um, and then is really mad and so runs away overnight but hasn't really made a plan and doesn't get very far and then ends up coming back. Sometimes these, come, these returns are negotiated. There's a classic example in the case of um, Peter who runs away from the Reverend James McSparn in South County, Rhode Island, um, who is whipped and then whipped again and then runs away. And a neighbor sends him back with a note that says, here's Peter. Um, I'm sending him back to you on the condition that you don't punish him further. So that's a perfect example of a, a public operating, intervening in the relationship between the master and slave, in which the public there was surveilling. Uh, in fact, the neighbor was collaborating and returning um, the runaway to um, expire on the master. But he also was interposing a kind of a limit. 
who's making a judgment and giving advice about what kind of um, relationship between those two was most appropriate. In the case of Venture Smith, um, this, is, this is what we know from the runway. It's nice to have the advertisement that reminds us that, uh, or lets us know, that in many ways, his account of the experience is very closely paralleled um, by independent um, evidence. He mentions the cheese and the clothing and the other guys. The ad mentions the cheese, the clothing, and the other guys. One of the things that we wanted to think about the history of um, the role of the public um, in slaves running away is that the behavior of the public changes dramatically over time. Individual cases, how successful are people trying to make an escape? You know, and there's very little systematic evidence. No one puts a thank you note up in the newspaper. <laughs> oh, thanks so much. I got adventure. Um, so we don't get a statistical compendium of captured runaways versus um, attempted runaway advertisements themselves. Um, and different kinds of, of um, legal matters that come into court. So for instance, early in the century, it seems um, very likely that if you run away and the master publishes an ad, um, the public is going to be on the lookout for you, they're going to collect your reward, they're going to send you back, and it becomes, it seems to me, extremely difficult um, to escape slavery in New England, especially because the black population, population of color is relatively small, so you're relatively conspicuous. Venture Smith, 6'2", he's four inches taller than the average white person, um, you know, he's, he's going to stick out. It's going to be hard for him to disappear into the woodwork. However, by the end of the century, New Englanders have pretty much given up publishing runaway advertisements. <laughs> so that's a total transformation of the role of the public um, in um, their, their, the extent to which they'll collaborate with or um, the master or they'll collaborate with um, the person being held in slavery. And obviously, if we're thinking about Venture's relationship or any slave's relationship with his master as a negotiation, um, the ability to run away really enhances the bargaining power of the person being held captive. Um, um, generally, it seems with the intent of allowing them to purchase their freedom back from him. Um, but sometimes they ran away before they paid him. So in one case, he writes, around 1770 or so, um, the date's unclear, he bought a guy. Um, he says, for man, for no other reason than to oblige him, and give and gave for him sixty pounds. But a short time after, he ran away from me, and I hear thereby lost all I gave for him, except twenty pounds, which he had given to me previous to his absconding. So that was an arrangement where, like, he apparently purchased the guy for sixty pounds. The guy still owed him forty, um, and decided, well, I'm not going to pay him the forty. I'll just run away, um, and succeeded. All right. Violence is another relationship. Um, and we often think of violence as one-sided, um, master for violence against slaves, and slaves as entirely um, dependent upon the whim of masters in this regard. But in fact, there were both practical and um, political limitations on the amount of violence masters could use. And an important um, double standard in the way um, the public regulated master-slave violence.